Welcome everyone to the Cincinnati Cabinet of Curiosities. I am your host, Kat Cloco. Tonight, we have Tim Fuller here. He is the artist of our Loveland Frogman segment. And recording in the shadows is our producer, Christina Wald. Everyone can wave at her. She will not wave back. Uh, <laughs> I am the editor of the Cincinnati Cabinet of Curiosities, and I'm excited to have the Loveland Frogman to introduce to the world, or maybe you already know him because he's already nationally known and maybe internationally known from some of the gashapong that I've gotten in Japan. Uh, Tim did a piece about the Loveland Frogman. He is a well, Tim is much beloved, but also is the Loveland Frogman. He's a much beloved character here in the Cincinnati Tri-State area. Now, first, I want to give a little bit of the history of our cozy cryptid, the Loveland Frogman. One night in May of 1955, a businessman traveling home spotted what looked like three four-foot-tall frogmen standing under a bridge crossing the Little Miami River. One of the frogmen lifted up a wand that illuminated sparks, which scared off the man. In March of 1973, a Loveland police officer, Ray Shockey, was driving on Riverside Drive near the Totes Boot Factory and the Little Miami River when an unidentified animal scurried across the road in front of his vehicle. The animal was fully illuminated in his vehicle's headlights and was described to be three to four feet long and about 50 to 75 pounds with leathery skin <laughs> he reported spotting the animal crouched like a frog before it momentarily stood erect and climbed over the guardrail and back down towards the riverbank. Two weeks after that incident, a second Loveland police officer, Mark Matthews, reported seeing an unidentified animal crouched under the road in the same vicinity as Sh Shockey's sighting. Matthews shot the animal, recovered the body, and put it in his trunk to show the officer. <laughs> According to Matthews, it was a large iguana, about 3 to, or 3.5 feet long, and he didn't immediately recognize it because it was missing its tail. It was speculated that the iguana had been someone's pet that either got loose or was released when it grew too large. According to Matthews, Shockey was shown the dead iguana and it confirmed it was the animal he had seen two weeks previously. The Loveland Frogman was spotted yet again in August of 2016 when a teenage couple playing Pokemon Go between Loveland Madeira Road and Lake Isabella claimed to see a giant frog near the lake on August 3rd. It stood up and walked on its hind legs, they claimed. Artist Tim Fuller takes a humorous look at the Loveland's, at Loveland's favorite cryptid for his entry into the Cincinnati Cabinet of Curiosities Comics Anthology. Welcome, Tim Fuller, to our show. Yeah, it's great to see you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's great to see you too. Um, so tell us about your piece. It, I love it. It is like a Sunday comic strip but about the Loveland Frogman on a date. I fell in love with the Loveland Frogman story. I think it's just, it's a great thing. I've had a, a long uh, interest in uh, cryptid sightings and the like. Uh, and when I read the Loveland Frogman story, I thought it, it was so much fun. There was so much there. I wanted to do a longer piece with it, but I, I knew I had some time constraints and, uh, chose to do instead sort of a, a gag strip with the mm -hmm. love. My work is all primarily humorous uh, anyway, so it would have been out of my comfort zone to do like a dramatic reenactment of this. I thought it was more fun to uh, to approach it humorously. Yeah, I, I love the, it. The, the Loveland Frog's looking over my shoulder here. To yeah, he is. We give okay. him more credit. <laughs> but I, I love the piece. Now, did you draw this digitally or is it done by hand? That one is a hundred percent digital. I usually start out in pencil and and you know rough things out first and then it goes into the computer. Uh, in this case I, I did all my pencils everything uh, straight into the computer other than just some preliminary sketches to you know uh, try different looks with the character. Mm -hmm. Yeah that I I just love it. Now, did you grow up with the Loveland Frogman around, or where did you learn about him? 
I grew up in Portsmouth, Ohio, which is about two hours upriver from Cincinnati. So it's, okay. it's right in the Ohio River uh, Valley. And um, I was in high school during the early 70s. And UFO followder, followers and paranormal uh, um, people know that uh, the Ohio River Valley was legendary from about 1965 to about 1975. There was all sorts of activity, mm -hmm. UFO sightings, uh, cryptid encounters, uh, hauntings, just, and, and I grew up hearing all of these stories. Uh, I looked up, uh, before we started talking, I looked up some of the very haunted uh, places in Portsmouth. And uh, it turns out I've, I've been to almost all of them. Oh, wow. Uh, but I can't say, I don't have a story. I can't say I've ever had an encounter in any of these places that were supposed to be uh, so haunted, other, other than my own house. I grew oh. up in a house that had uh, a restless presence in it that was always sort of making itself known or, or you know, kind of intruding on us. And um, I didn't go out looking for, for other spooky things. I had enough on my hands uh, right at home. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if you want to go more about your hometown haunting right now or save that for a little bit later. But I'm, cur uh, I'm curious now, though, now that you brought it up, what happened around your house? I never actually saw anything like an apparition or a shadow person or anything like that. But as a, as a young child, there were just places in the house. It was a, kind of a large rambling old house. There were places in the house that I was just terrified to go in. Mm -hmm. uh, they just scared me no end. And I just thought it was just part of being a, you know, a scary kid. And, and, you know, I, I accepted it as that. And there were parts of the house I just, avoided mm -hmm. uh, particularly the basement there was uh just a semi-finished basement with about three rooms uh down there including one room that had originally been a a, a coal room they must have had a coal furnace at some time mm -hmm. and they had this long narrow room with a window at the end of it and a sloped wall and so they would pour the coal in and it would just tumble into the room and they'd stoke the furnace um Anytime I went in the basement, no matter what kind of mood I was in, my mood immediately changed. It was oppressive. It was, it was hard to breathe there. It just, you always felt like you were being watched. And like I said, as a kid, I just kind of passed it off as, you know, just kind of a spooky old house. Mm -hmm. uh, I inherited the house as an adult and moved back in after college. And come to find out uh, and the, the same feelings that I had in different parts of the house, I had in the, as an adult. My mood would completely change mm -hmm. uh, when I uh, went to the basement or the attic or you know, there were several other places that seemed kind of uh, uh, off. But I made the mistake of trying to set up my art studio in the basement in that coal room because it was so unique. It was just a long, thin room with shelves all, all down one side. And I would try and paint there uh, late at night, and I had my back to the door, and I was always turning around because I felt like oh, there was God. someone there, there was someone watching me, and I didn't last very long in that studio. I moved it back up to the first floor after that. Yeah, yeah, that, no, I've been, I, I lived in a haunted house. I know exactly that oppressive feeling that you're describing. I don't know how you could work down there for 10 minutes. Yeah, it, it was just too much. And then I began to notice I, I, I had grown up with a cat. We, we had never wanted to get a dog, I guess. I don't know. Um, but as an adult, that's the first thing I went out and got was a dog. And uh, she, you know, lived there and, and I'd play with her and we'd be in different rooms. Her demeanor would change very suddenly. Like she would be sitting in front of me, being petted, talked to. All of a sudden she would look straight up at the ceiling terrified and out of the room she would go. And this happened over and over and over again, oh, as wow. if she was seeing something that I couldn't see. Yeah. Oh, wow. That, that's, that's creepy. And so you eventually moved to Cincinnati. Well, you're not in Cincinnati. You're in Northern Kentucky. I'm in Northern Kentucky, close enough to Cincinnati. Yeah. yeah Cincinnati. But yeah, yeah I, I finally sold that house. Uh, it, it just got to the point that, uh, 
it wasn't fun to live there. And no sooner had I sold it and you know, the deal was all done and I was moved out, uh, a friend's dad told me that an old woman had hung herself in the coal room. Didn't seem to know when, but why did they tell you earlier? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'd, know, I'd known this family forever. I grew up with these people. And, you know, why they didn't think to mention this to me <laughs> before that, I don't know. I guess he thought, uh, uh, you know, I couldn't do any harm with the information once yeah. I Yeah, it, that it just creeped you out more. It explained a lot. Oh, um, wow. Wow. So getting back to the Loveland Frogman, um, what inspired you? I know you do com comical stuff, but the subject matter is the frogman on a date. What inspired you to come up with that topic? I'm trying to think if the title came first or the punchline came first. It's kind of a corny joke. I mean, it's a, it's a fly in the soup gag. Mm -hmm. It's with these characters. And the title is Froggy Went a Court. <laughs> so I think really the first gag that I got for it is is the first part of the date where where frog frogman meets the uh, human girl that's come on the date and met him at the restaurant is that neither one of their uh, tinder photos look at all like him mm -hmm. frogman has used a picture of Mi michigan j frog from the looney tunes cartoons the singing frog and she's used a picture of jessica rabbit as her mm -hmm. profile picture so that was, that was the first gag in the strip. And the rest, it, it just kind of wrote itself. It was just an exercise in silliness. Yeah, and I love it. it it's, I you. like how this anthology is really meant for everyone to enjoy. Like, it's not hardcore slasher horror. We have, it, we run the gamut from the Penny Dreadful type stories to your Sunday strip type stories to Rodney's um, Twilight Zone-esque story with the uh, Loveland Castle. And I, I love how every single one of these stories has been different. And uh, I like, I like yours. Um, let's see. Well, so thank you're you, on. Thank you so much. Uh, it, it's a great anthology. I'm really looking forward to uh, getting to read the whole thing because the bits and pieces that I've seen are just tremendous. Yeah, everyone has done really good work, which brings the question, you are also our art director of the project. So um, what has that been like putting the project together? You're really putting the skeleton of the anthology together. It's a part of doing comics that I enjoy. I was a graphic designer for most of my professional career. And uh, I enjoy using my design skills. A lot of times when I'm writing and drawing the comics, that doesn't come into play, but I always look forward to designing the package that it, it goes in. And this, in this case, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And you're a wizard at that. That's, that's stuff I've never, even a little concept. I can't do it. So it's, I just sit here. I'm like, wow, you're so talented. You know, everything, Tim. <laughs> it's it's um, a, a long and, and infamous career. Is, is what it is. <laughs> And for those who are also artists that are tuning in, you did this digitally. What did you use to create it? Like, what programs were you using? I think I worked, well, first I worked in Clip Studio. That was mm -hmm. all the penciling and the inking and, and that. I, I kind of work across the board. I use a lot of different programs. I eventually got it into Photoshop for all the tonal work and there's a lot of texture and, and kind of, you know, uh, zippy stuff going on in there. And then I think all the lettering was done in uh, Illustrator. I, I like how clean Illustrator is with that kind of work. Yeah. And then it was all imported and kind of composited in Photoshop. Oh, really nice. Well, I think since you already shared your ghost story, do you have anything else you'd like to comment about the anthology project? Well, um, just how, how exciting it's been to see this all come together, seeing all these different artists step up and really kind of bring their A game to this. And I think the, uh, the book is going to look fantastic when yeah. we find it all together and, and, uh, 
out to the press. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. So with that, thank you for joining us tonight, Tim. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And this is the Cincinnati Cabinet of Curiosities Comics Anthology. I am Kat Cloco. We also have Christina Wald in the shadows producing. You can find more information about our Kickstarter for the Cincinnati Cabinet of Curiosities Anthology. We're hoping volume one um, at Cincinnati Cabinet of Curiosities on Insta or Instagram and also at Sin Cabinet Curio on Twitter. See you around. Happy hauntings. Come on. <laughs>